From atop the saddle of his horse, one chieftain, following the path laid by his father, subjugated tribes, clans, a whole civilized kingdom, and brought the mighty Chinese Empire down to its knees. Such was the life of the first of the Manchu leaders, Huang Taiji. Born in 1592 in the Jianzhou Jichen tribe, the young Abahai, as he was called in his youth, was the eighth son of Nurhaci, the tribe's chieftain. His father was a respected and inspiring leader. Abahai grew up in good conditions, alongside many siblings, being part of the ruling clan. He showed devotion to the clan, and his aptitude led him to be favoured by Nurhaci. In 1616, as the chieftain founded his new state, the Khanate of later Jin, he made Abahai and three other family members senior chieftains. The young Abahai also became leader of one of the eight banners, military and social divisions of the Jichen people, that had been created by his father. He probably ruled over the bordered yellow banner. The growing autonomy of the Jichen people, unified by Nur Hachi under his state, did not sit well with his Chinese overlords. As the Jichen leader declared war on them, they were quick to answer, mustering Chinese, Korean and rival tribes together in a confederation. In 1619, the later Jin Khanate was attacked by this enemy coalition. Abahai demonstrated his bravery in battle, distinguishing himself further in the eyes of his father, who was able to bring victory to his people at the Battle of Sarho. Two years later, Nurhaci started to initiate his son to civil administration, giving him responsibility over some state affairs. As the later Jin Khanate grew in size, it had to integrate many different peoples with different cultures to the Jichen. A Han Chinese revolt broke out in 1623 in conquered territories in Liaodong province that was violently repressed. This led Nurhaci to grow distrustful of the Chinese. Previously he had tried to integrate them into his state by giving them concessions, but after this event he no longer wanted to deal with the issue. Instead, he ordered Abahai to oversee the integration. Cunningly, the young man preferred organizing political marriages rather than using violence or bribes to strengthen bonds between the Jichen and Han Chinese people. After a life dedicated to his work, Nur Hachi fell ill and died in 1626, designating no heir to the Khanate of later Jin that he had founded. His sons and the Jichen princes agreed to designate Abahai, young but determined, to succeed to his father. Therefore, on the 20th of October, he became Huang Taiji, the second Khan of the Jichen state. He did however not possess absolute authority yet, being part of a government called the Four Great Baylor, or Chieftains, with three other senior chieftains making decisions with him. Huang Taiji, the 30-year-old leader, had to prove his worth to secure his rule. A conquest had to be conducted. The target was obvious. Although the later Jin Khanate was at war with the Chinese Ming Empire, it did not have the necessary resources to conquer it yet. The few neighbouring Siberian tribes did not pose a great threat, nor had any riches to pillage, and the Mongols were already friendly to the Jishin cause. However, on the other side of the Yalu River stood the Korean Joseon dynasty. The country was in political turmoil, and in the last years, several Korean rebels had joined the late Jin Khanate, urging the state to depose the newly crowned king of Korea, Injo. The Chinese Empire, ally and overlord of the Koreans, would be too busy fortifying its own borders to send enough troops to aid the Korean Joseon dynasty. And finally, the Korean Peninsula had many resources that could later be useful for the Jichen against China. Back in 1619 at the Battle of Sarho, the Joseon dynasty had sent 10,000 soldiers in aid of the Ming against the Jichen, so in the eyes of the Jichen, the justification for war was already set. Huang Taiji started making preparations. In February 1627, Huang Taiji ordered several major Jichen commanders, supervised by Chieftain Army, to lead 30,000 soldiers into Korea. They would be guided and advised by rebel Korean generals who had defected and joined the Jichen, hoping to weaken and overthrow the Korean authorities. As the Yalu River, separating the later Jin Khanate to the Korean Kingdom, had frozen, it offered easy access to Choson lands. The Koreans realized that if the borders were breached, the Jichen would be free to pillage the whole nation, and fought valiantly at the board of fortresses. Eventually, the Jichen army was able to break the resistance and flooded into Korea. They were met with only one reinforcing Chinese general, Mao Wenlong, who was rapidly defeated 
and escaped with his men, leaving the Koreans alone against the Jirchen stampede. The Jirchen then besieged the town of Anju, where after several days of fighting, the Korean garrison sacrificed itself by blowing up the city's powder reserves. Nothing seemed to stop the thousands of Jirchen men and horses. By now, morale was practically broken on the Korean side. Pyongyang surrendered without resisting. A few hopeless battles took place, but eventually the king of Korea, Injo, who had escaped to a fortified island, dispatched envoys to negotiate. For the negotiations, Huang Taiji ordered Amin, leader of the invasion, to impose a peace treaty. Its conditions would state that Korea no longer would accept Ming authority, send hostages to the later Jin Khanate, and respect the Jirchen authority and territorial integrity. Huang Taiji's authority within his Jirchen people was now secured. Shortly after Amin had began the invasion of Korea, Huang Taiji launched his own campaigns against Ming China, leading 40,000 men. At the heavily fortified city of Jinzhou, where 30,000 Chinese soldiers were entrenched, Huang Taiji was unable to achieve victory and had to war the retreat. He then tried to besiege Ningyuan, where his father had been defeated a year earlier. The same local Chinese commander who had driven off his father, Yuan Chonghuan, had however extended the defences of the city, and like he had done previously, he relied on his powerful artillery. Once more, the Jirchen were repelled. Huang Taiji, rallying his forces, attempted two more attacks on Jinzhou, but was again unsuccessful. Brute force could simply not overpower the Chinese artillery. In late spring 1627, he had to resign himself and return to Jirchen lands, where famine and banditry had spread due to a harsh winter and the war. As he would not accept defeat, he started planning a new attack, making changes within his army. Taking example on his enemy, the later Jin Khan organised the development of his own artillery force. He ordered the purchase of powerful European cannons. They would be manufactured and copied, and later operated, by Han Chinese defectors, who were much more proficient in engineering. By 1629, thanks to his determination and success in the invasion of Korea, Huang Taiji managed to become the supreme leader of the later Jin state, now making decisions on his own. That same year, Time had come for the Jirchen to attack China again. Huang Taiji led his forces and successfully breached the Great Wall and captured Jinzhou and several other towns. The Chinese rapidly realised that the Jirchen had this time come not to pillage, but to conquer. Losing control over the situation, the Chinese defenders were repelled towards Beijing. Of course, counterattacks were constantly launched against the Jirchen Eight Banner Army, but each time a Chinese general sent his men to repel the invaders, he was defeated. Inevitably, the Jirchen hordes got closer and closer to the Ming capital. Inside the imperial city within Beijing, the Chongzhen Emperor grew profoundly uneasy as nothing seemed to stop the advance of Huang Taiji's army. But while all hope was fading for the Chinese, an unexpected reinforcing army was on the march to stop the Jirchen. Yuan Chonghuan, who had already beaten Huang Taiji once and his father before him, had gathered some 20,000 veteran soldiers from Ningyuan with the resolve to drive off these barbarians or die fighting. Outside the walls of Beijing, where Huang Taiji had arrived, Yuan Chonghuan faced the unstoppable Jirchen army that numbered over 100,000 men. With minutious strategy and planning, and to the surprise of many, Yuan Chonghuan was victorious once more. Interestingly, at the battle, one of the only female officers in the whole history of Imperial China, Qin Liang Yu, led troops from her native Sichuan province to fight against the Jirchen. Huang Taiji had to withdraw with his hordes, but in his retreat back to later Jin territory, he pillaged Chinese cities for money, resources and equipment. A few northern Chinese cities nonetheless stayed in later Jin control, now part of the Jirchen state. Yuan Chongquan, not wasting any time, then ordered the northern cities in China to be reinforced, turning them into real fortresses. The brilliant Chinese general would however be victim of conspiracy. Accused of having betrayed the Ming dynasty, and secretly collaborating with the Jirchen, he was sentenced to death by the Chongzhen Emperor. Without flinching, the innocent general was resigned to his fate and wrote a death poem. In front of the public, Yuan Chunghuan suffered the death by a thousand cuts and took over a half a day to die from the torture. 
If you're curious about this method of execution, don't hesitate to go and watch my video on Ling Shi. Links in the description below. Back in his Jishin state, Huang Taiji rallied his forces. He kept developing his artillery force, by now possessing dozens of European and Chinese cannons. The occasion to test this new kind of warfare appeared soon. By late 1631, at the Battle of Da Lingha, Huang Taiji could finally test his new cannons on a large scale. The fighting between Chinese and Jishin was fierce, and a large part of the 8th Banner Cavalry was lost, but eventually the Jishin pushed through. In an attempt to destroy their enemy's newly acquired artillery that proved powerful, the Ming soldiers set fire to the dry grass so that it would spread towards the cannons and destroy them. In a surprise turn of events, the winds changed direction, bringing back the fire and the Ming soldiers had to escape. Many of their officers were captured, most of them defecting to Huang Taiji's army. The Jichin leader, pursuing in the momentum, moved southwest into China. While advancing in Inner Mongolia, the later Jin Khan encountered the Chahar Mongols, whose leader, Ligdan Khan, had broken off diplomatic relations with Huang Taiji's father, Nurhat Shi, a few years earlier. A few skirmishes occurred between the Chahar and Jichin, but eventually, the Chahar leader, Ligdan Khan, already facing war on other fronts with rival Mongol tribes, fled with a hundred thousand men, thus ceding a great part of his territory to the Jichin sphere of influence. In parallel, several more Ming generals defected to the Jichin. By now, the balance of power was beginning to shift towards Huang Taiji's side. Ligdan Khan, the Chahar leader, died in exile in 1634, and by the next year, the remaining Chahar Mongols, led by his son, were completely subjugated to Jichin rule. In their surrender, they offered Huang Taiji the imperial seal of the Yuan dynasty, greatly boosting his influence in the eyes of all the Mongol peoples. Huang Taiji had now amassed immense political power. That same year, in 1635, in order to solidify the unity within his people, and confirm total autonomy vis-à-vis -vis the Chinese, Huang Taiji decided to completely reform his society. Now rejecting the Chinese appellations of Jianzhou or Jichin, he adopted for his people a name from his own language. Under an official decree, the Jichin had now become the Manchu people. With a fresh common core, the Manchus could now bind together for the same goal. Much like the name of its people, the later Jin Khanate was also coming to an end. This was not because it was failing, but on the contrary, because its prestige had grown so strong that the Manchus could not contend themselves with a mere Khanate. In 1636, Mongol, loyal Han Chinese and Manchu nobility assembled in the capital of Mokden, modern-day Shenyang, and after discussions, they suggested that the Khan Huang Taiji become an emperor himself, conspicuously rivaling with the Chinese Ming Emperor. He dissolved the state his father had established, only to proclaim the founding of the great Qing dynasty. He would be the first of its many emperors. To the disbelief of the Chinese, it seemed that now nothing could stop the momentum that the Manchu were following. While subjugated Mongol and Han Chinese people recognized his legitimacy as an emperor, the Joseon Korean envoys refused to bow down at his coronation, as they still only saw the Ming emperor as legitimate. The Kingdom of Korea, that had been subjugated years earlier in Huang Taiji's first campaign, was furthermore suspected by the Manchus to host Ming and Manchu fugitives. It also still supported the Ming army, subsequently violating the peace treaty that had been established back in 1627. Finally, when two official Manchu delegates were dispatched by the new Qing Emperor to meet with the King of Korea, he refused to receive them, even refusing to communicate with letters. This was too much of a humiliation for Huang Taiji. It was time for another demonstration, as Korea had to be subjugated again. The new Qing forces saddled up, after having sent forces along the coast of the peninsula to ensure the Ming could not send reinforcements by crossing the sea. The second invasion of Korea could begin. In December 1636, Manchu, Mongol and Loyal Han forces, under the eighth banner of the Qing dynasty, started marching to Korea. This time, the Joseon fortresses on the northern borders that had been reinforced held on, preventing a full-scale invasion from the north. The Manchu forces, however, also landed by ships into the peninsula. This time, they ensured the king of Korea, Injo, could not escape to a fortified island as he had in the past. Encircled, the king found refuge in a mountain fortress, 
Attempts by the Joseon army to relieve him were overturned by the swift Manchu cavalry. Nonetheless, the Korean mountain fortress held on. By January 1637, the Korean army even managed to destroy Manchu siege weapons. Furthermore, Korean musketeers and cannons that had been constantly perfected in the past years proved effective against the Qing forces. Nonetheless, it was only a question of time until the Koreans would have to surrender. The king's second son and consorts were captured by the Manchus, who, using them as hostages and threatening to destroy royal ancestral shrines, forced negotiations. The king Injo finally surrendered. Under the new peace treaty that was signed, Korea effectively became a tributary state to the Qing Empire, offering supplies, men, warships and money to its new overlord. But while Huang Taiji's main objective was still China, he also worked to pacify and integrate the Siberian Amur River Valley, where many tribes and peoples such as the Evenks, Daur and Solon people lived. In the late 1630s, the Manchu Emperor sent four successive expeditions to conquer and integrate the local tribes, who rapidly all became nominal subjects of the Qing dynasty. Only the Evenks, under their leader, Dular Bombogor, successively drove off Manchu armies. But as time passed, many of his soldiers switched their allegiance. In August 1640, the Evenk leader was forced to flee. He escaped to Mongolia but was eventually captured, brought to the Qing capital of Mugden, and executed. With his death, the last remaining peoples in the Amur River Valley were subjugated to Manchu rule. Huang Taiji had no more opponents in the north. The Mongols in the west were loyal to him, and the Koreans to the east had been vassalized. All military efforts could now be focused on the Ming Empire that was already stricken with domestic rebellions. In 1638, the Qing forces launched raids on Chinese territory, swiftly retreating after each attack to plunder and weaken the Chinese. The Ming Emperor, Chongzhen, ordered his armies to focus on the domestic rebellions rather than the Manchu raids, who he judged were not the priority. Whether he had already realized it or not, the days of the Ming Dynasty were numbered. In the beginning of the 1640s, the Qing Emperor organized new campaigns against the Chinese. Huang Taiji, always working on perfecting his strategy, designed supply lines to carry month-long sieges against enemy cities. At the Battle of Songjin, the Qing forces besieged Jingzhou as reinforcements. Over 100,000 elite Chinese troops from Songshan, led by famous general Hong Changchou, came to the aid of the besieged city, but were crushed by the Eight Banner Army. Jin Zhou surrendered. The Qing forces then besieged the mostly empty city of Songshan and captured it too. Finally, the Chinese general Hong Changchou and his remaining men defected to the Qing forces, dealing a great blow to the Ming Dynasty. With Yuan Chonghuan long dead and the other great Chinese generals now loyal to the Qing, it was only a question of time until all of China would be under Manchu rule. But as Huang Taiji was making plans to conquer Beijing, his health began to falter. The death of his primary consort, who he loved dearly, overwhelmed him with grief. As months passed, he showed no signs of recovering, his health in fact worsening gradually. The emperor realized he would not live much longer, and declared, Steeper the mountain is, the more it might collapse. Taller the tree grows, the more it might fall. The wiser we grow, the older we are. It is what the will of heaven imposes on us. Huang Taiji started to delegate more and more state affairs to subordinates and spent much time praying. Eventually, on the 9th of August 1643, the Qing Emperor died at the age of 52. His body was transported to the Manchu capital of Magden and interred in the Jiaoling Mausoleum that can still be visited today. Much like his father, Huang Taiji died without designating an heir. A succession crisis therefore broke out, as his half-brother Dorgon, a mighty commander who had participated in most campaigns, and his eldest son Holger were candidates. The tense situation was eventually solved, as they both received noble titles, but Huang Taiji's ninth son, a five-year-old, became the next emperor. He was crowned on the 8th of October 1643, under the ruling name of Emperor Shunzhi, and would later in his life be the first to reign from Beijing. In practically 17 years of rule, Huang Taiji continued in the steps of his father to bring forth the Jichun people by establishing the Manchu culture and Qing dynasty, an even stronger state than his father's later Jin Khanate. He further improved the Manchu writing system and bureaucracy, 
and subjugated the Mongols, Korean and Siberian people to Manchu rule. His strategy of integrating the subjugated people and treating them well prevented resistance in conquered lands, and his decisions to enroll defeated Chinese generals into his own army was probably the best way to bring down the Ming dynasty to its knees. With the Qing Empire ever growing stronger and a united army at the Manchu Chinese borders, the nearby Beijing now only seemed to be like a fruit to pick off a tree for the Manchu people. Thank you for watching my video, I hope you enjoyed it. If so, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments section below.